Sidney Powell's motion for the recusal of Judge Emmett Sullivan and for other relief was not drafted to be granted in the short term, it was drafted to form part of the record in the long term. <laughs> Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and by popular demand, I cannot not do a vlog on Sidney Powell's motion for the recusal of Judge Emmett Sullivan and for other relief. I can't not not do a vlog on it, so I'm gonna do a vlog on it. I'm gonna break it down, go over the highlights, because a lot of it is rehashing stuff that we have seen in previous vlogs, but there are a few new elements that are absolutely important. Now, when I say that this motion was not drafted to be granted, it is not to be mean to Sidney Powell. It is not a criticism of her work. This motion was not drafted to be granted because this motion is never going to be granted. Expecting Judge Emmett Sullivan to grant this motion would be more than expecting him to admit that he was wrong and biased. It would basically be like expecting Judge Emmett Sullivan to admit that he was wrong, that he's biased, that he's dumb, that he's ugly, and all other sorts of bad things about him. I'm stupid. You're smart. I was wrong. You were right. You're the best, I'm the worst. Uh, you're very good looking, I'm not attractive. All right, as long as you're willing to admit that. Sullivan is never granting this motion. Sidney Powell knows that Sullivan is never granting this motion, not just because it would be tantamount to Sullivan admitting that he was wrong and biased, but because also there are a lot of things addressed in this motion that the Court of Appeal has already decided on, effectively. And I will go over those, but this motion also raises a number of new issues that occurred during the most recent hearing subsequent to the decision rendered by the Court of Appeal that reversed the panel decision and sent the entire file back down to Sullivan. So with that said, let's go over the highlights of Sidney Powell's motion for the recusal of Judge Emmett Sullivan and other relief. Motion to disqualify Judge Emmett Sullivan and for other relief. Judge Sullivan's immediate disqualification is mandatory. 28 U.S.C. Section 455A requires that a judge, quote, shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned, end quote. And Section 455B1 states that a judge, quote, shall disqualify himself where he has a personal bias or prejudice concerning a party, end quote. In both instances, the test is objective because, quote, what matters is not the reality of bias or prejudice, but its appearance, end quote. And, quote, a showing of an appearance of bias or prejudice sufficient to permit the average citizen reasonably to question a judge's impartiality is all that must be demonstrated to compel recusal under Section 455A. Sidney Powell then goes on to re-raise the argument that was already raised before the full panel of the Court of Appeal to the effect that a judge has to recuse himself from a file when he is a party to those proceedings. 28 U.S.C. Section 455B5 little i requires a judge to disqualify himself when, quote, he is a party to the proceeding, end quote. When the district judge aggressively petitioned for rehearing en banc as if he were a party, it invoked the application of this section sufficiently to trigger the application of 455A for the appearance of bias and 455B1 for personal bias against General Flynn himself. Now, when I say that this motion was not drafted to be granted, it's because these very arguments were already raised and pleaded before the full panel of the Court of Appeal, and they already dismissed these arguments. I have already done a vlog breaking down the full panel panel's decision. If you haven't seen it, I'll link it right here, give it a watch, but you will recall one of the arguments raised before the full panel was whether or not Judge Emmett Sullivan had become a party to the proceedings by petitioning for a rehearing en banc. <laughs> the argument was made that Judge Emmett Sullivan, by having filed the petition for rehearing en banc, effectively made himself a party to the proceeding. The majority for the Court of Appeal actually pretended that even though Judge Emmett Sullivan did in fact file the petition for rehearing en banc, it was one of their active members who raised the question sua sponte on their own motion so that they need not address whether or not Emmett Sullivan made himself a party to the proceedings with his petition for rehearing en banc because they raised the issue sua sponte. It wasn't him. Law or legal corruption, I leave the answer up to you, although although I think I know what most of you are probably thinking. I'm too old for this. After going over some case law and the criteria of what is necessary to establish the appearance of bias, Sidney Powell then goes back to certain statements that Emmett Sullivan made back in 2018, all issues that have already been addressed. Judge Sullivan's prejudicial statements and conduct have become increasingly shrill, unprecedented, and prejudicial, and apparently influenced by extrajudicial sources. His false and defamatory comments at the December 18, 2018 hearing echoed those of Rachel Maddow. And there may be no greater insult to a judge than being accused of echoing the opinions of Rachel Maddow, and we all know now that Rachel Maddow in fact issues opinions and not fact because that's what a judgment said. Wink. At what was scheduled as a, quote, sentencing hearing, but became, unquote, extended colloquy, Judge Sullivan expressed his, quote, disdain and, quote, disgust for General Flynn's conduct, stated that he, quote, sold out his country, end quote, and suggested that General Flynn had committed, quote, treason. There was no factual basis for these defamatory comments. These are also arguments that were already raised before the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal issued an opinion on it. Opinions formed by the judge on the basis of facts introduced or evidence occurring in the course of proceedings do not constitute a basis for a bias or partiality motion, 
unless they display a deep-seated favoritism or antagonism that would make fair judgment impossible, end quote. And the Court of Appeal came to the conclusion that Judge Emmett Sullivan made those comments on the basis of the facts of the file statements made by Michael Flynn. I don't personally agree with it. I know that a ton of you out there are probably going to disagree with it, but the Court of Appeal has already talked about it. Sidney Powell then re-raises yet another issue that has already been addressed in the past, the potential borderline abject bias of Judge Gleason and the Washington Post commentary that he wrote prior to being mandated. Judge Sullivan read John Gleason's WAPO and adopted the procedure recommended therein to delay and derail the government's motion to dismiss. On May 11, 2020, Mr. Gleason, a longtime mentor and proponent of Mueller Special Counsel Office Lieutenant Andrew Weissman, published an opinion piece in the Washington Post and argued that Judge Sullivan can appoint an independent attorney to act as a, quote, friend of the court, end quote, ensuring a full adversarial inquiry. If necessary, the court can hold hearings to resolve factual discrepancies. Within 48 hours, Judge Sullivan took Gleason's op-ed as a job application and appointed him to implement Gleason's plan. Ignoring that prosecutions rest within the core duties of the executive branch, Sullivan instructed Gleason, quote, to present arguments against the government's motion to dismiss, end quote, and General Flynn, and further ordered Gleason to, quote, address whether the court should issue an order to show cause why Mr. Flynn should not be held in criminal contempt for perjury, end quote. Again, all issues and arguments that have already been presented to the Court of Appeal, and they have already adjudicated on them. Petitioner points to the district judge's failure to grant the government's motion, his appointment of amicus, and his plan for a briefing schedule that addressed potential submissions by other amici as, quote, bespeaking a judge who is biased against petitioner, end quote. But, quote, judicial rulings alone almost never constitute a valid basis for a bias or partiality motion, end quote. Now, with all that said, things do get very interesting in the motion when Sidney Powell starts bringing up facts that are not already part of the court record and that have occurred since the hearing before the Court of Appeal. Judge Sullivan's ex parte involvement of his personal counsel, Beth Wilkinson. Not only did the court violate separation of powers and engage a like-minded hostile amicus to prosecute General Flynn, but it also engaged its own personal outside counsel to assist in the court's continued prosecution of General Flynn, an engagement which apparently continues to this day. This is something we've talked about in previous vlogs. Judge Emmett Sullivan mandated his own personal attorney. He mandated his own personal attorney to represent him in the context of this court file. Now forget about the fact that his attorney is apparently paid for by taxpayer dollars. His personal attorney is none other than Beth Wilkinson. What? No. No. What? <gasps> no. <gasps> and for those of you who may not know who Beth Wilkinson is, let me just uh, illuminate something for you. Flynn Judge Emmett Sullivan hires veteran trial lawyer Beth Wilkinson. In the D.C. Circuit now, Wilkinson is counsel to Cheryl Mills, a former aide to then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, in a dispute over a deposition in a public records case. Beth Wilkinson, in fact, represented four of Hillary Clinton's aides, and why would this be relevant? Well, Sidney Powell will explain it to us. When the FBI began its probe into the scandal that Hillary Clinton had maintained a private server for her emails while Secretary of State, Clinton aides turned to Beth Wilkinson. Overlooking conflicts of interest, Wilkinson represented four. Cheryl Mills, Jake Sullivan, Heather Samuelson, and Philip Rines. Mills and Samuelson were given immunity despite their roles in destroying evidence in the form of Clinton emails. On September 29, 2020, while General Flynn's counsel was still arguing in the district court against Amicus Gleason, Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe released a letter in which he announced the declassification of new, shocking evidence in response to a request from Congress about, quote, information related to the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Crossfire Hurricane investigation, end quote. Ratcliffe declassified this information showing that, quote, U.S. presidential candidate Hillary Clinton had approved a campaign plan to stir up a scandal against U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump by tying him to Putin and the Russians' hacking of the Democratic National Committee, end quote. Just as of yesterday, DNI Ratcliffe has declassified additional supporting information. DNI Ratcliffe also stated that the report regarding Mrs. Clinton was not Russian disinformation. Accordingly, there is evidence that Hillary Clinton approved the plan to create the fraud of Russian collusion that provided the pretext to frame General Flynn. This motion was not drafted to be granted, it was drafted to be read. In a further attempt to show Judge Sullivan's bias, Sidney Powell goes on to explain how Judge Sullivan himself did not respect his own Brady orders. Judge Sullivan has flouted his own standards of justice by refusing to enforce his Brady order and obstinately ignoring the merit of the shocking new evidence produced by the government. Perhaps the most baffling, quote, special treatment, end quote, of General Flynn that exemplifies the court's stunning bias is the court's refusal to enforce its own Brady order 
order, even in the face of government admissions of suppressed Brady evidence recently produced. Sidney Powell then goes on to fault Judge Emmett Sullivan for not acting with dispatch, and this is where I have a bit of a problem with what Sidney Powell is doing in that she is adding to the judge's inability to act with dispatch. Most courts would have granted the motion to dismiss as a pure matter of routine on the record within days of its filing. Not only does all precedent require granting the motion to dismiss, but none warranted so much as a hearing because the government's motion was documented with multiple productions of long suppressed Brady material. Even when ordered to dismiss by writ of mandamus, the court did not grant the motion. Instead, it litigated the issue itself. Sidney Powell then goes on to describe the September 29, 2020 hearing, which if you missed it, you did in fact miss something. I did a vlog breaking it down. If you haven't seen that, I'll link it right here, but you could hear the tone of Sullivan's voice. He doesn't like Sidney Powell. I don't know why, but I don't think he likes Sidney Powell. The court's bias and rancor was palpable at the September 29, 2020 hearing. The hearing on the government's motion to dismiss marked the first time a federal judge has presided over a hearing regarding a defendant against whom he personally litigated to prolong his prosecution, not to mention defying the writ of mandamus issued by an appellate court. His antipathy for defense counsel Sidney Powell was evident as he grasped at straws in his attempt to create a false narrative of the case itself, conjure up the political bias he and his amicus claim motivated the dismissal motion, and manufacturing non-existent ethical issues. First, the court insinuated Ms. Powell had committed an ethical violation by writing a letter to the Attorney General on June 6, 2019, requesting an independent review of the Flynn file. The court expressly stated he wanted to bring this to the attention of the public, that it had been, quote, under the radar screen, end quote. He questioned the government about it first. Government counsel saw no impropriety and pointed out that anyone can write such a letter. When the court had a string of questions for government counsel demanding information about any response Ms. Powell received from her letter, information government counsel would have had no way of knowing, the court angrily cut Ms. Powell off when she offered to provide answers to those questions. There was no neutral arbiter in these proceedings. The hearing reeked of the court's bias. But where it got objectively bad to the point of abject bias was when Judge Emmett Sullivan raised of his own volition whether or not he could dismiss the charges without prejudice, meaning that Michael Flynn could in theory be prosecuted for the very same charges in the future. This judge asked whether he could dismiss the case without prejudice, thereby permitting a future attorney general General or a future administration to reopen the prosecution of General Flynn. He also wanted to know if a new attorney general could pursue General Flynn for uncharged conduct. The court pushed this issue despite well knowing the purpose of Rule 48A to foreclose prosecutorial harassment and the government's unequivocal motion to dismiss with prejudice. Judge Sullivan himself noted in United States v. Pitts, quote, the principal object of the leave of court requirement is apparently to protect a defendant against prosecutorial harassment, e.g. charging, dismissing, and recharging when the government moves to dismiss an indictment over the defendant's objection. End quote. Again, this court shut down defense counsel's discussion of Pitts. It could not be more obvious even to the untrained observer that this judge, Amicus Gleason, Ms. Wilkinson, and those politically aligned with them are delaying, posturing, and briefing this case as a political tool, hoping the Democrats will win the election and a Democrat administration will continue the political prosecution of General Flynn. That is the very abuse a Rule 48A dismissal is to prevent. That is a damn good point. And it gets even better. General Flynn requests production to the defense of the following documents and information in support of this motion. One, the names of all persons listening on the court's line for the hearing on September 29, 2020 that were not clerks of the court. Two, all communications by and between Beth Wilkinson and any members of her firm with any other persons about General Flynn or this case since the panel of the DC Circuit Court issued the writ of mandamus. Communications after the mandamus issued would amount to ex parte communications about strategy and tactics to use against General Flynn and his counsel in a criminal prosecution. Counsel further has reason to believe that Ms. Wilkinson was either in the courtroom off camera for the hearing or otherwise communicating with the court before, during, and after the hearing. All evidence of these communications must be produced to the defense and violate judicial canon of ethics 3A4. All communications between Ms. Wilkinson or any member of her firm, any member of Chambers, and Mr. Gleason and any member of his firm about Mr. Gleason's role, briefing, strategy, questions, and preparation for the hearing regarding General Flynn. The court and Gleason denied communicating with each other, but obviously someone communicated with Gleason on behalf of the court. Four, all communications and visits with Eric Holder about this case or General Flynn, identification of the number of visits Eric Holder has made to Chambers about this case or General Flynn, or other personal meetings regarding General Flynn with Eric Holder, to whom Emmett Sullivan referred as, quote, Eric, end quote, 
on the record in the hearing. Five, all communications by Emmett Sullivan about General Flynn or this case with anyone outside chambers since the motion to dismiss was filed that would evidence Emmett Sullivan's own intent or desire to continue the prosecution of General Flynn as any and all ex parte communications about this case would further mandate his immediate recusal. Sidney Powell then goes into what I find to have been the most shocking thing that I actually could not believe occurred during the September 29, 2020 hearing. During that hearing, Judge Sullivan was actually relying on documents, correspondence, ex parte correspondence, meaning correspondence that were not communicated to the other parties that the judge had received the eve before the hearing. It was not documentation that was already part of the court record. It was not evidence that was adduced before all of the parties. It was literally a letter that the judge received the night before the hearing that was not communicated to the other counsel from Peter Stroke's attorney claiming that some of the handwritten notes on some of the documents were altered and that they were not his. On September 28, 2020, Eitan Goldman, counsel to former FBI Deputy Assistant Director Peter Stroke, who was fired from the bureau after he was exposed for his own bias and extraordinary malfeasance, emailed a letter to the court regarding documents on the record. He did not copy counsel for the parties, nor did he seek leave to intervene. Upon receiving the ex parte communications, the court failed to follow the procedures required by Canon 3A4. Instead, it promptly filed the letter on the docket and substantively considered it, saying at the hearing that it was, quote, floored, end quote, by the letter's allegations. Indeed, it considered the ex parte communication from counsel for stroke even before reviewing crucial submissions of the parties. Now, if you're not an attorney, you might not appreciate how over the top and offensive this actually is. Right now, we have people who are not parties to the suit, who are not involved in the proceedings, communicating with the judge ex parte without notifying the attorneys to the other parties. Communicating documents that are not part of the court record have never been adduced as evidence through the adversarial process, and then you have the judge actually putting it on the docket, that is to say, considering it as evidence. Going so far as to say that he is floored by the allegations in the letter. Now this may or may not be evidence of bias, but it is evidence of absolute improper conduct. Judge Sullivan's substantive consideration of the Goldman ex parte communication spurred other lawyers to seek to influence the court. On October 2, 2020, Michael Bromwich and Rachel Peck, lawyers for former F FBI Deputy Director Andy McCabe emailed a similar letter to the court. While Bromwich and Peck did copy counsel on their letter, it was still an improper extrajudicial communication that sought to induce the court to violate Canon 3A4. When confronted about his improper communications, Bromwich justified his actions by specifically relying on the court statements from the bench in favor of the Goldman letter. As it stands now in a prosecution the government has dropped, General Flynn is forced to litigate against this court, his amicus, and his firm, the court's personal counsel and her firm. And now counsel for McCabe and counsel for Strzok and their firms, not to mention the many amici, all in unprecedented procedures created by this court to accomplish its patently biased agenda. And if there is one paragraph to retain from this entire motion, it is this paragraph. Judges are to decide cases based solely upon the facts and arguments presented by the party's counsel through the judicial process, not by emails to chambers from counsel for the miscreants that caused this travesty of justice, tirades of television talking heads, or the opinion columns of intemperate former judges. This court's continual failure to abide by multiple rules and precedents, not to mention the specific requirements of Canon 3A4, have substantively and materially prejudiced General Flynn. Quote, all that must be demonstrated to compel recusal then is, quote, a showing of an appearance of bias sufficient to permit the average citizen reasonably to question a judge's impartiality. End quote. The appearance of bias here is terrifying and mandates disqualification. I wholeheartedly agree. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think Judge Emmett Sullivan got his seal of approval from the full panel of the Court of Appeal. But like I have said many times in this vlog, this motion was never intended to be granted. It was just intended to be read and read it. I did. And if you like my videos and you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a comment in the comment section below because it feeds the algorithm. Feed me all night long. If you want to support the channel, all of these support links are in the pinned comment. We've got PayPal, Subscribestar, Patreon, YouTube membership. We've got merch. Members get sneak peeks of the vlogs in as much as I can provide them. But more important than all of that, take care of yourselves. Check in on friends and family. Make sure everyone around you is doing well. And now you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah!